Hello and welcome to the Doyen Interviews with me, Bridget Nathan. This is a podcast that speaks with inspiring women from the art, architecture and design world. Illustrated by Grace Yeo and accompanied by music from a non, I'm glad you've tuned in. Thanks to Coolon LED Lighting for supporting this season. Coolon offer an awesome range of architectural lighting. I'm especially interested in their strip LED, which can change colour. The Doyen Interviews acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we are recording. We recognise and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Okay, welcome to our next guest, Marina Carroll. Marina is currently based in Sydney, where she's a principal at Architectus. Conveniently, Marina and I have already met, as when I was in Sydney recently, she took me on a tour of a local market where I noticed her flair for craft. Thanks, Marina, for joining us today. We'll be chatting about business development, so your approach to generating and winning work, as well as strategizing, so thinking about projects before they even exist. So, welcome, Marina. Just to get started, um, what is your background? And, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about your current role and, yeah, um, your approach to architecture. Sure thing. So um, I like that you've mentioned craft already and I think I'm going to start there. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, um, you know, just thinking about, you know, my background and I think um, where it all really began was um, making stuff. I like to make stuff and um, the arts and crafts is where that began, you know, from the youngest age. I was always making things. Um, And from there I really grew up in a bit of a household of engineers. So my oh, um, wow. father was an engineer, my um, grandfather was a builder, my brother-in-law was an engineer, my sister-in-law was an engineer, um, lots of engineers. So when it came time for me to um, figure out what to do after school, guess what I thought of? Be an engineer. <laughs> so <laughs> I went into engineering. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, because I thought that's um, that's where you made stuff. Um, yeah, I thought that's I thought that's where you made buildings. Um, wow, cool. Yeah, and so I did that um, for a little while. But it's funny. Um, I was doing it at Monash University, and they have like a a generalist undergraduate degree, and um, I found myself hanging out with the industrial design students, ah, and a lot cool. of them had put down architecture as well and they kind of um, introduced me to what architecture was and I transferred out of engineering pretty quick smart into yeah. architecture. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And so how did you find that first year or that first stage of engineering as compared to architecture? Yeah, I think, look, I think if I'd stuck with engineering, you know, I, I sort of um, working with site engineers and stuff now, I, I think I would have liked it. But, you know, the course um, paled in comparison to what we do in architecture, like all the model making and the drawing and the ideas, like that's that's yeah. um, much more me. Yeah. The, the, the formulas and the, <laughs> and the um, other side of things is, is less me in the um, engineering side. I mean, I liked yeah. it, but it was just, it was just a lot drier. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And so how's your path been from then until now? Has it been pretty straight path or like what have been some of the highlights of your background? I don't know. This might be a low light. It was a highlight, but it yeah. was hard getting that highlight. Um, yeah. So I did, I studied at Melbourne Uni, which was really great and, um, Great experience and formed lots of really good friendships, of which you know some. Um, and <laughs> then I got a, um, a job with Bait Smart partway through my study. And um, the part of that was when I was at school, the chairman of our board was Roger Poole, who was the um, director and chairman at Bait Smart and I was school captain yeah. at the time so we kind of crossed paths a little bit but this was still when I didn't even know architecture was a profession right but when I reconnected with him um, and I remember going in for an interview with him and I had like my year two folio like my second year folio <laughs> in architecture and it was yeah. like in hindsight mortifying the, <laughs> the <laughs> elements that were in the folio you know some of them were just like 
I remember I had a drawing of like a puppy in there just because it was a really good drawing. <laughs> You're like, I can draw. <laughs> Bridget, like in hindsight, it was mortifying. He was incredibly kind um, oh. <laughs> and, and reviewed my folio. Anyway, so I worked there for um, many years, which was really, really good um, foundation to my yeah. learning. Like they're a great practice. Um. And then from there, I did take some shorter contracts um, because I've been there for so many years um, and I, I suppose I I didn't know what other firms were like. So I took some short yeah. contracts and tried out a few different things and just went and worked on some design competitions and then um, started at Architectus, I think, eight or nine years ago um, right. and have been there ever since. And. How has it been? Has it been? Has there been a lot of change um, at architect in architects during that time? Yes, yeah, definitely. So I think when I started, um, maybe it was like forty people. I think in the Melbourne studio. Gosh, I don't know what it is at the moment. Probably about eighty or ninety, I would say. Um, yeah. So that's pretty radical change, but it's been so good. Like obviously, I wouldn't have. Um, stayed for as long as I have it hadn't been good it's it's I've just always been challenged and I've always been able to just take opportunities and push ideas and um, I'm constantly learning and um, it's been an incredible um, environment to develop as an architect um, and yeah sort of surrounded by a great community great culture lots of great mentors um, and as I said, I've just always been able to pursue and sort of push things further and, um, and yeah, and, and I suppose that brought me up to Sydney. Yeah. Um, and what sort of projects have you been working on? Um, I mean, lots of different projects. Um, most recently, um, a lot of um, schools and universities, um, which, yeah, is, I suppose, um, a big interest and passion of mine is the education sector. Um, yeah. So, you know, we've done a number of projects um, with major universities, so um, Melbourne University, um, some large projects under construction at the moment with Macquarie and then um, a lot of schools, so both public and private schools. Oh, amazing. Um, I guess that kind of segues a little bit into one of my questions, um, which is what I'm asking everyone um in this season because of covid mm. thinking about adaptation um mm. i mean i'm not sure how you're feeling at the moment with everything that's going on um with universities and i mean there's been so much work in that sector um and i'm sure there will continue to be um but things are changing and education is changing Thinking about adaptation generally, what does that um, kind of concept mean to you? Yeah, I think, I mean, firstly, I really like that you've gone with the word adaptation. Um, <laughs> I think because, look, it comes up a lot in design as well, especially, oh, I'm sure it comes up in other sectors, but definitely in education. And yeah. um, people often talk about flexibility versus adaptability. Um, yeah. And I think you know, the, the same thing applies for, um, you know, how you go about your career as to the the spaces that you're designing. So I think what, when we talk about flexibility, you know, what comes to mind is just this, um, you know, this incredibly loose space that almost doesn't do anything effectively but could do anything but never sort of gets to its potential, whereas adaptability or um it implies it's got the ability to really effectively do a few things very well. And I think that is my same approach to adaptation. Like I think if you are going to adapt, you do it strategically and you be smart about it and you assess it and you map the path. I think um, flexibility, on the other hand, kind of has this go with the flow kind of feel to it. But I think... Um, adaptation is much more strategic so I suppose that that's what it means to me. Well that's really interesting so would you say that um, in your role and maybe 
um, in architecture, strategic thinking is something that's important to you? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I like to think of myself as a strategic thinker and it is something I would like to get better and better at as well. Um, I'm working at the moment with another principal, Mark Bentonenden, and he is like just a strategic mastermind. <laughs> wow. So, cool. yeah, yeah, it's a really... Um, it's a really great way of thinking, just sort of looking at these, um, looking at anything from multiple vantages and um, strategically mapping a way forward. Wow, that's so interesting. And so do you think um, like having that strategy has enabled you to adapt in your career, like either in the past or like at the moment or um, I guess you're in a leadership role? Um, mm. So do you find that th that sort of thinking is is really helpful? Like are there any examples of projects that you're working on or um, like things that have happened where you've sort of had to really put your strategic hat on? I suppose looking at it two ways, so both from a project perspective and maybe a career perspective. I think on the career side I think I have a natural ability just to kind of see holes or see opportunities or see kind of what needs to be done and that to me is strategic thinking to an extent um and so I suppose that's the way I've approached my career is almost by filling those holes um yeah. and and crafting you know what I think needs to happen um with the projects I mean I work a lot um you know, in an area called strategy. So often it's that very, very front end before, you know, a brief even it exists. Um, and that's actually something I really enjoy is kind of creating um, a framework or, um, you know, even just a vision for something that doesn't even exist yet. Would like some examples of that be like forward thinking to potential clients or like opportunities that a client may not have considered or yeah, I think it's all those things. Um, yeah. So on the client side, you know, they might come to us very early on just saying we um, want to put together uh, or we've, we've got a, a project in the pipeline. We don't have a brief for it yet. We need to, um, you know, start framing up what this thing is going to be. So we've done this kind of work for um, RMIT recently, um, you know, similar work we'll, I'm doing with the University of Adelaide at the moment, putting together their sort of vision for um, teaching and learning environments in the future. Um, wow. So it's almost kind of fits into that pre-design space, you know. It's not even yeah. a design yet. It's pre-design. Um, and you're right in terms of um, business development, I, I think it's the same approach. Um, you sort of, um, you know, see problems that need to be solved or you um, – you know, have an idea of something that um, is going to happen and you sort of map the way or create a, a framework to get there. It's interesting how at the start of this talk you mentioned, um, you know, a drawing that you did at university and now mm. we've very quickly moved into this realm of talking about, you know, meeting with clients for future generation learning environments that don't even exist. I think it's amazing to talk to people and hear about, um, yeah, their pathway into architecture because it's such a, um, I think it's such an interesting profession because you really learn a lot from when you finish university to obviously where you are um, mm. at the moment. Um, and another thing that I wanted to ask about is something else that I think is maybe starts at uni with your presentations but gets developed a lot in the workplace, mm. which is confidence. Um, yeah, confidence is something that I think is, you know, crucial in these sorts of situations. Mm. Um, how have you found building your confidence to be able to, yeah, engage in these sorts of discussions and um, put forward these like probably brave ideas sometimes? Mm. I think a, a term that I've, that I quite like um, that I've come across recently is the idea of self-efficacy. And this right. is slightly different to self-confidence and it's it's more around you know for me it's more around sort of the proven evidence that you can um do these things and you can master new challenges you have done it before and you can do it again um and I think 
that resonates quite well with me. You know, I, I always felt um, when I was studying, you know, I didn't know enough. And I thought, oh, once I, once I do my master's, then I'll know enough. And then yeah. um, I got my master's and I'm like, oh, I still don't know enough. And then I thought, okay, well, once I've done my first end-to-end project, then I'll know everything. And I'll do yeah. that. And you still don't know enough. And then I thought, oh, once I get registered, then, <laughs> then I, will, I will know everything. But you kind of realise that you just get really good at learning. Yeah, yeah, um, and there's always going to be another milestone where you think, um, yeah, I think a lot of people could probably, um, yeah, relate to that way of thinking where you're always thinking, oh, once I do this, I'll, I'll then I'll feel secure. But yeah, it's yeah. true. It is. Um, it's a bit of a constant learning process. Um, and I think I've kind of switched the other way now. You know, I'm going to be, you know, if I ever get to a situation where I'm not learning, well, then get out of that situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, I've been thinking a lot, well, I guess we've all had a lot of time to think recently. I think, like, always learning is really important. Um, and I'm yeah. trying to do that a lot with this podcast because sometimes I get, like, quite, intimidated by the guests because I'm like oh it's like this new person and uh, I don't know them and I'm so like I'm like oh no but then you talk to them and you realize like it's just a person like Mm. and they've got something for you to learn um Mm. and yeah find that really nice yeah and I think that goes back to um I think you mentioned earlier like architecture being such a rich sort of profession and I think and I think you, you mentioned in the context of um you know universities and new learning environments that don't exist yeah. yet and that's what I think is so great about architecture is that you know you um hone your profession but through that process you get these insights into whole other worlds and professions that you never knew anything about so yeah um, I know we were doing these law courts um at Architectus and um, you know, I just learned so much about that um, profession um, just by hearing about, you know, all the intricacies of the project um, that, you know, you just never imagine or you don't come across normally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We found that the needs of the user have really, um, like, translated into the bigger picture. Definitely. Like, I... Um... I, you know, really pride myself on a user-centric um, approach to design. Um, definitely the human-centered, inside out. Um, I do a lot of um, stakeholder engagement and facilitation. So I think, you know, my whole philosophy is, you know, unless we're engaging with the users in that way, we're just going to design the same old things we have forever. You know, it's just based right. on precedent standards. Um but, yeah, there's been, you know, we're always um, gaining incredible insights into the users, unique cultures. I'm trying to think of exact examples. I mean, I've got a funny one, but it's nothing huge. Um, yeah. But we were running this um, sort of pretty long format um, stakeholder engagement for a big project at Macquarie Uni. And um, on our user group team, um, we had a representative from every faculty and then we had a representative from the student group. And um, this student rep was great. So she would sort of have all these conversations with her peers and her um, student group and sort of represent and relay some of the ideas back to us. But one insight we got from them is um, so we know that um, students sleep on campus and, yeah, and it kind of exists to varying degrees and some universities kind of turn a blind eye and some universities uh-huh. sort of embrace it more to make sure it's happening in a safe way. Um, but it was incredible kind of getting richer insights into how and why and where and all the various ways. And I remember her telling this um, one story where um, everyone has like a sleeping buddy and it's not as exciting as it sounds. Um, <laughs> you... <laughs> It's not that. Um, you you are studying <laughs> away, and when you're napping, your sleeping buddy will watch your stuff, and then oh. you sort of sleep in shifts throughout the night. Um, oh. Anyway, it was just really interesting. And then there's students who you know there's a huge cohort of students who are in fact homeless and live on campus. And there's yeah, there's there's this. Um, 
a, a really large number. And then a, a lot of students who commute really far. So during, um, you know, if they've got back-to-back -back days or during SWAT back, they will live on campus. Um, wow. Where do they live? Like, um, so this is like not in student residences. This is like no. informal places. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I never even knew that existed. Yeah, well, I suppose um, architecture students just work through the night, so it's not deemed to be <laughs> living. <laughs> wow. I guess universities are such massive places. Like, they are little cities sometimes, so mm. it's not that surprising. Um, have you – would you have ever thought you'd do, like, a different type of architecture, like resi or, um, I don't know, like, hospital design? Like, is – where you are, do you think where you'll be for a while? Um, I mean, I don't think necessarily I would stay in education forever. Like, I suppose yeah. I like it um, for many reasons. Like, I like that um, typically the owner is the occupier, is the user, is the financier. Like, I think that leads often to good architecture. Um, yeah, yeah because you can custom design for that person and they can make, um, I suppose, um, financial decisions that are more long-term, for example. Yeah. You know, they're not looking to flip their investment. Um, so I think it, it does lead to quite, quite rewarding architecture. Um, but I think, you know, the, the kind of skills that we have and the sort of user-centric approach to design, you know, it's transferable to... Um, you know, lots of things, public buildings. Um, I mean, it's transferable to resi as well. Um, yeah. I suppose I like big projects though. I'm not sure I would do single resi, but I'll never say never. Um, mm. I like, yeah, like I like working in community-based projects for similar reasons. Like I like mm. it that deep, like really nice detailing that might only be available to someone who can afford architecture. They can like experience that in a university mm. or a library, I think that um, is really amazing. And I visited um, the um, Arts West project, which I mm. think, um, did you work on that project? <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually an Architectus ARM joint venture. And yeah. Um, and, yeah, I was on that for about oh, three years, I think. Wow. So. I am curious. So when you're at Architectus and you mm. do, like, a joint venture with mm. – um, ARM like how did that work how does that um do you do like you have certain people in each office are you collaborating like it, is it as though um the person in the other office is your colleague in the same way that they would be um usually or like how did it work yeah so this one was interesting so for the um Arts West project we had both been shortlisted um and I think we were, you know, we're each one of four. Um, right. And I think the brief called for like two key things. So one was um, what they called landmark architecture. Um, right. And the other one, I think they would have called it like, um, you know, global leading learning environments or something. Um, right. And that was a bit of a perfect marrying between our practices. Um, so that's when we looked to pair up um, when we were shortlisted. And it's interesting because um, I've been party to a couple of joint ventures and I think, you know, there is so much benefit to being in the same studio. Um, yeah. Even if it is not for the whole time, but, you know, so much of it comes down to effective working relationships. So yeah. in this example, um we worked down in ARM's studio for, look, it was varying depending on the stage and the project, but I was probably in their studio for about maybe six months or eight months or something. Um, and we just kind of divvied up the team. Like you, for large projects, you often, you know, have your org structure and your roles and responsibilities. And, um, and we just sort of divvied up the team between ARM and architect as people and, um, and it worked really well. Like it was a really, um, a really great joint venture, and um, you know everyone worked really cohesively. It was, it was good fun. What an amazing experience! Um, yeah. How many like people did you have in total from each of the practices working on it? 
Oh, it varied at times. Um, yeah. But I'd say during like the peak of design time, maybe like six from each, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And did you enjoy the process of like working with the people at ARM? Like was it challenging? Did you at times have different ideas about how you wanted things to go or was it sort of like you are now on a team so everyone was kind of working towards the same sort of goals? Um, look, there is always creative differences, even if you're all yeah. on the same team. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> that's true. So that's very there, true. <laughs> there definitely <laughs> was. Um, yeah. So uh, Peter Bickle um, was project lead and he was fantastic. Um, he's a pretty strong personality, but, um, you know, really great to work with. Yeah. Um, you know, Ruth Wilson was the director in charge on our side and she's, oh, you've oh, cool. interviewed Ruth. Yeah. Um, she's absolutely yeah, formidable. She's amazing. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, and, and Andrea Wilson was another standout. So she's um, an interior designer at um, ARM. She was great right. to work with. Neil Masterton's really prolific. Like he's just, the rate at which he produces drawings is just amazing. So wow. yeah, there, was, there was definitely um, differences and um, yeah, like any project, you just kind of, you know, work through them, look at the options, pros and cons, test them, test them, test them. And, um, and yeah, yeah, it was good. I love that area at the bottom where it sort of looks like, yeah, that it's got that beautiful light and it, yeah, it feels like, I don't know where it comes from, but there's like it seems like there's some Greek influences or something. Like you feel like yeah. you're really in this like um A little bit agora. So. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's really cool. Um mm. and so yeah, like what sort of things are you interested in outside of architecture? Like how do you stay um passionate and driven? Because yeah, I would imagine that your role sometimes could get pretty full on, like everybody's. Um, yeah. Like yeah, what are you, what are you interested in outside of architecture? Always making something, um, often yeah. for someone. So I'm always um, doing that, and, and really, um, you know, staying passionate's probably not my issue. Probably the yeah. uh, my issue is toning it down every now and again. So <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, because we have such a great team, and there's so much energy. I actually um, get a lot of my passion and energy from the team so yeah most of the things I do on the outside are probably more about um toning it down so um I love being at home listening to a podcast doing a bit of craft whether I'm you know sewing something or knitting something or sawing something or um <laughs> that is my happy place yeah um, I mean I play lots of sports I, I just before COVID hit I'd recently taken up AFL um, oh, cool. Yes, but I have only got, you know, halfway through preseason and we all had to stop playing. Um, yeah. Oh, I actually didn't even think about that because I don't play any sports, but it would be really challenging for, like, people who are, have a lot of team sports in their life. Yes, yeah. I love it. So I play. I was playing netball and footy and, um, you know, it's such a great community of women, both of them, and um, such a great outlet. And for me, that's the closest I think I'll ever get to meditation, you know, just focusing yeah. <laughs> on the ball flying at my face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that's like what meditation is about, like doing things yes. that just take you out of your yes. everyday. Um, yeah, yeah t- talking about women, um, mm. Have you how have you found it being a woman in architecture? Have you had any um, like challenges that you would want to talk about? Um, I mean, I think there's always challenges. Um, most of mine, have, I think, have been mainly self-imposed. To be honest, um, you know, going back to Arts West, you know, I do remember something I had to like untrain my brain to do was, um, right. you know, I was the site architect um, yeah. for a couple of years there and, um, and you know, obviously a very um, 
male-dominated environment. And they were a great team. So it was um, Can Construction. They were great. But right. honestly, whenever I, you know, stuffed up, you know, <laughs> or um, I didn't know something, you know, I yeah. felt like I was reinforcing a stereotype that would make them think, oh, you know, women. Ah. Um, and I, I felt like I had to remind, you know, I felt like I was representing all women, which I obviously wasn't. Um, yeah. But that was something I had to remind myself, like, you know, I'm not um, tarnishing, you know, female architect's reputation by not knowing everything. Yeah, I totally know that feeling on a much smaller (laughs) scale. It's like you're sitting in a meeting and everyone's a guy and then they're all looking at you and then I sometimes I think, make sure you say something that's really on point right now. <laughs> then I'm like, I would never think that. In another situation when it was like half guys, half girls, I would just talk exactly. normally. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And I think I've, I've been in other situations too where, you know, people are pretty backwards. Um, but, you know, my um, strategy is just to be always to gravitate towards, you know, great people, great culture, people who want to do great work um, and just yeah. leave the other people behind. Yeah. Did you have any advice um, for yourself when you were just starting out in architecture? Um, Gosh, Uh, maybe, yeah, Marina, you're not representing all women all the time. Give yourself a break. Um. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, Um, you know, probably just, you know, your first um, question around confidence, you know, just... um, having that confidence and as I said sort of it took me a little while to realize that um I'm not going to know everything um yeah but I can get really good at learning and finding things out and um and, and it is funny because I mean that's what I really enjoy like I really enjoy um problem solving and I really enjoy um collective problem solving like I like building relationships with people as we move ideas forward or as we solve problems so um you know to be someone who knows everything is not a rich and collaborative way to solve these big these big problems yeah. and these big challenges do you have any kind of immediate goals that you're focusing on or um any like project challenges that you're sort of um going through at the moment yeah, again, many things. Um, I have started my MBA, so I'm doing one. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just started that. And that's been a really, um, really great way to take a bit of a step back um, yeah. and look at things from a different, through a different lens. Yeah. Um, so I guess a goal would be to keep doing that and to finish it eventually. Um, yeah. You know, on the on the small scale of things, I'm working on my footy bounce. That is my COVID development goal <laughs> to be able to run and bounce a footy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Also, it's anything to get out and do some exercise. Yes, like, I'm going for a walk up exercising. <laughs> yeah, um, but I think look, the yeah. big thing for me probably is, um, you know, I do want to be a really good leader, and I do really want to create great environments for people to thrive like that gives me a lot of joy to see people kind of growing and developing and being at their best um that is something gives me a lot of joy so I want to be really good at that yeah oh I bet you're doing an amazing job um yeah COVID sort of um yeah it's just changed a lot of things I think for a lot of people and it'll be like at the start I thought it would just be like a short-term thing but Mm. it sort of sounds like even once restrictions are lifted, um, yeah, it's going to have a massive effect on the world. And um, that's, like, why I wanted to, like, really push and do the podcast this season because I thought how awesome to talk to all these architects about, like, what they're doing in different states and because mm. architects are, like, really at this like, the forefront of a lot of, um, like, yeah, the way that our world looks and operates. So, like so interesting yeah and it is interesting even like this being your sort of foray into more interstate um interviews as well because it's kind of this two-part system isn't it in one sense because we're so locked down we're all so local and our boundaries are very strong because we're not allowed to travel anywhere we're not allowed to fly anywhere but at the same time because we're all just in the digital realm there's no yeah there's no borders 
Yeah, it's so, so true. And, yeah, also going another step further with, like, international relations and thinking about um, how close people are. And, like, before I was actually thinking to come up to Sydney and do the interview because they've got, like, you and then there's a few other people in Sydney. So I thought it would be amazing to come up and, like, have a look into the offices and take some photos. And I had in my mind that that's how it would be. But then once COVID happened, I was like, oh, that definitely can't happen. I'll have to do it um, all online. But then, yeah, sort of because of what you're saying, it's actually really awesome because it's meant that I can just, like, plug in all these people and, yeah, there's no boundaries to it. You can just chat and <laughs> it's, it's Adaption. really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's a pleasure. And, yep, I hope everything goes well in Sydney. Thanks, Bridget. That was fun. Thanks, Marina, for that chat. Next up, we'll be chatting to Nayan Puri. I hope you can join us. So I signed up for a natural building course in Thailand and then had plans to, and then I went to India and worked with bamboo. So it was a year of pretty much just my hands in the mud. Um, where I worked with mud brick building, bamboo, um, bamboo construction, earth bags, cob, which is like straw and mud all put together. And um, yeah, so I spent a year pretty much experimenting with all those different types of building methods. 